Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. I share something kind of funny with you. Well, you might find it funny, may not. But um, so I always keep my phone in my right pocket, right? And I'm coming back up front here from talking because that's what I do. And I hit my front pocket. And I'm like, "Where's my phone?" Which you know you shouldn't really freak out like that. But I've been known to lay my phone down in places and forget where they are. Well, it was right here. I left it sitting up here during practice. So we found my phone. I guess we're ready to worship, right? <laughs> But it's good to be here this morning, uh, good to be able to uh, come together and to worship, so I want to welcome you, I want to welcome those of you that are tuning in online. Uh, so let's just go ahead and start to worship this morning, because you know Jesus, he bridged that gap between us and God, and uh, we can now have that one-on-one -on -one relationship, so we can go into the Holy of Holies, because there's no separation anymore. So let's stand together and let's just celebrate and let's sing, Take Me In. God, we do thank you for bridging that gap between, between us and you. 
Jesus, for taking our sins on the cross and making a way for that one-on-one -on -one relationship. Father, thank you that the only way to heaven is through your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, there is no other name under heaven or earth by which we can be saved but the name of your son, Jesus. Father, we worship and we praise you this morning. In Jesus' name I pray.
can be seated. We continue to worship today. Let's be singing praise him, praise him. our communion time this morning. So as we prepare to partake together of the emblems, let's be singing, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? wondering lately 
Is it some sort of rite of passage or something for teenagers to not like their parents' music? <laughs> I know I sure didn't like the songs that my parents listened to when I was growing up, and I felt that a little bit with a recent country music kick that I've been on. I will say, though, that we spent a lot of time jamming to some kids' music by Lori Bruckner and Chip Richter when my kids were little, and I'm thankful for the river and the message that provide kind of a positive, happy medium for several years in between. As part of this recent country binge I've been on, Sirius XM Radio has a station dedicated to the top thousand country songs of all time. And number 501 on that list caught my ear just the other day. It's called Humble and Kind by Tim McGraw. Here's a few of the thoughts from that song. You know there's a light that glows by the front door. Don't forget the keys under the mat. When childhood stars shine, always stay humble and kind. Go to church because your mama says to. Visit grandpa every chance you get. It won't be wasted time. Always stay humble and kind. Hold the door. Say please. Say thank you. Don't steal. Don't cheat. And don't lie. I know you got mountains to climb, but always stay humble and kind. When the dreams you're dreaming come to you, when the work you put in is realized, let yourself feel the pride, but always stay humble and kind. Don't expect a free ride from no one. Don't hold a grudge or a chip. And here's why. Bitterness keeps you from flying. Always stay humble and kind. Don't take for granted the love this life gives you. When you get where you're going, don't forget to turn back around and help the next one in line. Always stay humble and kind. Many of those lyrics struck me as we have had four new young guys step up here lately and give meditations. And they have completely excelled beyond their years. So tying into the song, I found a few verses about humility, one of which is from 1 Peter 5.5. 5. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Given the fact that Hunter, Ian, Aiden and Drew have all done such a remarkable job up here, it made me think, I don't just want to learn from my elders. Of course I do, but I want to continue to learn from the example that those young men have set also. Short and sweet and to the point, but the point delivered so well. I have often worried about rambling on and on and missing the point. The point of this time is Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. We partake in the bread and the juice to remember that sacrifice each week. I have also learned a lot lately about not taking the Bible out of context. So here is more from 1 Peter 5. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day and for everyone here. Thank you for the ability for us to come together freely and share in this remembrance together. I pray that we can stay humble and kind throughout, with, your eyes, with our eyes and hearts always set firmly on you and the sacrifice that was made to free us from our sins. Thank you so much, and please bless the, all that partake in these emblems this morning. In Jesus' most precious name I pray, amen.
We'll continue into worship. Will you please be standing with me? We're going to sing together, Death Was Arrested. Seated. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. 
Good morning. I regret to inform you all that this will be my last meditation for a while as I am moving into college this Friday. Um, I would really like to thank Kevin, Bob, Mark, and Derek for their guidance and for their willingness to help and encourage me to stand before you all and give meditations. I would also like you to thank I would also like to thank you all for being willing to listen to what I have to say and for all the kind words I have received from you all since I have started giving meditations. And lastly, I would like to give Thanks to my family for their constant support for everything I've done from the, my time in high school to my future in college and beyond. You have supported me in all that I've done and will do, and I appreciate it that I appreciate that more than you will ever know. All right, back to the regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> <clears throat> As college rapidly approaches for many people, including myself, finances and money can be a very sore subject. I've been trying to work and earned some money for myself by working at Kroger for two and a half years. Today was my last day for a while, which was great. Um, we all have things we are trying to pay off and we are all trying to earn just a little bit of money. However, I would like to remind you all that we can only earn money because God allows us to. We should want to pay God back for all the blessings he gives us. Jesus reminds us this in Mark 12, 13 through 17. <coughs> Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew the hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Let us remember that as we struggle with all of our burdens and debts, that we need to give back for someone who has given all the blessings he has provided. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for this time, for all the blessings that you have given us, through your grace and your love and mercy, I would love. I would like to thank you for everything you have done, and I hope that we can use the blessings you have given us to help further your kingdom. In your son's name, we pray. Amen. Uh, Kim Hazelton. I uh, appreciate it if you would remember Kim. It says she has been diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, she's meeting with a surgeon on the 14th of this month, and we were reminded that her mother uh, also battled with breast cancer, so appreciate your prayers for Kim Hazelton and their family. Um, I got a text from Mike Chapman this morning that said uh, Daniel's condition was stable uh, as of this morning. His Oxygen saturation continues to fluctuate sometimes in the 80s. Sometimes they can get it back up in the 90s. But as we've said, it, it just continues to be uh, a very difficult roller coaster for them pretty much every day. Uh, there are signs both of uh, the end and of rallies. And so we just continue to ask you to keep them in prayer. Uh, Children's Hospital is doing a wonderful job providing them with uh, all the things that they need and letting everybody go in to visit. So just continue to keep them in prayer as, as they are having their vigil there with Daniel at the hospital. I don't know if you have any other needs or changes or Eve. My daughter is, um, has accepted a position in Oregon and she, she'll be leaving at the end of August. So okay. It's an 11 month position. Okay. So remember Alice says she's heading out to Oregon in November for 11 months to have a position out there. Let's just take advantage of this time to be praying and then I'll close. 
Father God, we pause again to be mindful of all that you have provided for us individually in our homes, uh, our church family, this community, um, our county, our country, just this world that is filled with your blessings. And there are times when that is hard to see. Uh, there are days when we are frustrated and discouraged. We are upset and in pain, and we just continue to remind ourselves that uh, there are folks here who are lifting us up in their prayers. They are continuing to bring us before your throne. We are reminded of opportunities to be renewed in our faith and our strength through your word, uh, through these times of prayer and conversation. Um, we also lift up our faithful missionaries, our brothers and sisters uh, in Christ around the world who are ministering, serving, struggling, uh, just uh, carrying the flag and battling for your truth. We pray that you would continue to provide strength and renewal. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Craig was talking about songs and children's songs, and Denise knows this one. I was I grew up with this one. You may be familiar. I'll just I'll give you about half of this. <laughs> Yes, sir. Right, right, right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg, head. And if we all do it, somebody's. Yeah, I can, I can get about four. But I was giggling because the uh, children's church stopped out there in the foyer. None of you could see them, but they were all paused out there behind you doing that. So, yeah, don't don't try it at home. Some of us, <laughs> um, you'll wind up in traction. Um, and, and I grant you, from the song, you don't learn a whole lot more about Abraham other than he had many sons. <laughs> and even that's like generationally speaking, because he started with two. You know. Point being, he's a very well-known faith character. Um, we continue through Hebrews 11, and two weeks ago, we stopped at verse 4, and we had just the one verse that was devoted to the life of the man Abel. Uh, last week, likewise, just a single verse, verse 7, that covered the efforts of Noah. So now as we come to Abraham, you may notice that we will look at eight verses. Uh, his section, actually larger, more verses than anyone else in the chapter. Abraham's a pretty famous faith person. And a lot of people in the world like Abraham. Uh, you can Google search, what do Jewish people think of Abraham? And it will say, Abraham, Abraham was the first Jew, the founder of Judaism, the physical and spiritual ancestor of the Jewish people, one of the three patriarchs of Judaism. They appreciate him very much. Um, that same article indicates that uh, Islam has a favorable view of Abraham, a man named Brandon Wheeler. Muslims understand Islam to be the religion of Abraham. The biblical figure of Abraham is mentioned by name in the Koran 69 times. That's more than any other biblical character except for Moses 137 times. A lot of people are very famous or fond of uh, this man Abraham. Uh, they're very eager to include him in their particular faith camp. And you can just answer to yourself, you know, what, what do I know of Abraham? What, what, what does Hebrews 11 say about his faith. 
and this is a question, what, what can you and I gain from considering or looking at Abraham's faith adventures? Here is Hebrews chapter 11. This is verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. I don't know how many trips you've taken that start out like that. Um, how long can you travel not knowing what's going on? Now, people with faith like Abraham's don't need every detail ironed out. You know? uh, the account is in Genesis. The wording in chapter 12 has Abraham responding immediately. In Genesis 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, you know, it, it says as he's being called. The verses start there on the screen, and you see God saying, I will do this, I will do this. And, and then at the end, it simply says, so Abraham left. I can think of several occasions, movies, heroes, heroines. What's the next step in the plan? And they look at you and go, I don't know. There's no plan. You know, I'm just making this up as I go. Um, I always think back to Ben Affleck's character, AJ Armageddon, driving that armadillo on the asteroid. And he's basically saying, I don't know. You know I, just, I just see this dot bl blinking. I'm trying to get us there. That's, that's as far as I can see. Um, one author was looking at this text and said, I suppose faith is a lot like getting married. Nobody knows exactly what lies ahead. So how big is your God? Am I willing to trust him? I'm going to put my faith in him, even though he's not given me every detail. And I've got to be honest here. We had our bus tour switched on us at Denali. And I was not very happy. Okay. Uh, we, we talked about it, me and some people. Um, and when, when, it, when it comes to vacation planning, I greatly appreciate Denise's yeoman work. I mean, she does a lot of the planning. We create a fairly detailed itinerary. If the kids or somebody you go with us, you're going to get, here's where we are this morning. We're going to travel, Lord willing, this many miles. We're going to spend, we think, about this many hours on the road. We're going to end up here tonight. Here's a hotel confirmation, etc. And then when in, Af in Alaska and Denali, you throw in the, the daily excursions and the meeting points, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And part of, part of the package, part of the Denali experience was this tundra wilderness tour. And I was looking forward to it. And the company that we worked with, booked it for us, the, the cruise line, and they gave you, initially, they gave you, like, the day you're going to go on the tour and the location and I think even the bus number. Well, then you physically get to the park, and it's the day before said tour, and they hand you their itinerary for tomorrow. And we look at it, and the kids quickly notice, um, we've been switched. Now we're on the natural history tour. Well, wait a minute, you know. Because if you're familiar with Denali, there's only one road that goes through the park. And you and I can only drive on the red part. You can only drive your private vehicles the first 15 miles. You got to rely on the bus if you're going to go after that. And, and I drew a little orange bar there, just to remind you, right now you can only go to about mile 43 because the road caved in. And they're working to repair that. But if you are a detail planner person, I'm telling you now, they don't expect that to be open until 2026. You know, and the only way to get that deep into the park where all the wildlife, I was thinking, lives is to get on the company-owned tour bus. And they switched me. And they were telling us, yes, it's the same, sir. I'm like, oh, no, it's not. It's not the same. Tundra Wilderness pointedly is looking for wildlife, and they're going to take me at least 43 miles. Natural history, I, don't, I didn't look that up. I, don't, I assume it's looking for a building. You know where they are. They don't wander around. You know, it's... <laughs> It's going to be right there, man. 12 miles is all they're going. I can drive that. You know, they overbooked. We were stuck. God did what he always does. Saw some amazing critters, sights, scenes, all in 13 miles. Calm down, tried to make the best of it. You know? And here's, read. here's why I tell you that. Had I not been given a very detailed printout promising me tundra wilderness, I would have never gotten fired up. 
If I just got a piece of paper and said, yeah, show up on this day and we'll put you on a bus and you get what you get, okay. But it was very specific. Details. You know? and, I'm, and I'm trying to learn to, to be a little bit more like Abraham in the faith walk. Leave the details to God. Because sometimes when I don't know all the details, I don't get as bent out of shape. You know? And I have walked long enough with God now to concur with what I know Abraham is going to tell you when you ask him someday in heaven. And he'll say, yeah, God never did steer me wrong. I didn't, I didn't always get every detail that I wanted when I wanted it. But he never led me astray. He always provided. And I don't know if you know anyone that wrestles with anxiety, less detailed faith like Abraham's can also help with anxiety. Richard Koken brought this point to light. I appreciate it. Such a faith does not demand to know what lies ahead because it trusts God. And without God, people get very anxious about the future, desperately trying to take control of all the circumstances, trying to protect themselves with all kinds of safeguards and insurance. It says we won't feel as anxious as we once did because we know we're safe in God's sovereign plan for every day of our lives. And he goes to Romans 8, which we look at, we, we know that in all things, including suffering and death, God works for the good of those who love him, to be conformed to the image of his son. And, and he notes, as we do, God may bring suffering or sickness or persecution for his children to endure, but only and always for them to learn to be more like Jesus in their faith. That's comforting. That's what brings peace to an anxious heart. What did Jesus say to people, I think, that might have been very detail-oriented in Matthew 6, repeatedly? <laughs> Do not worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Your Father knows what you need. You may have recently heard Peter's writing, 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Paul echoes the same, the Lord is near, Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I will grant you, if you hear that, say, I, I understand, I can follow with you, it's just tough. Let go and let God, you know, makes a good bumper sticker. Um, it's still hard to do. And I agree with that wholeheartedly until we are able to see God work. Once you've seen God work. And the more you see God's handiwork, the more willing I am to trust his methods. And I learn to, to leave the details to him. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is, Stephen is preaching what will become his last sermon. And what does he say about Abraham in verse 2? Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Well, what does he say Abraham saw? Glory. The God of glory. What will Stephen see with his very own eyes in that same chapter, verse 55? Glory. He'll see the glory of God. If you, when you see God's glory, even, even a glimpse, you see it the one time, it enables to trust for the next time. He may not tell me everything ahead of time. But a faith like Abraham's doesn't need every detail. So I challenge, my challenge this week is to look for the glory of God. Look for him at the fair. Um, look for him in the events in your household. Watch for God's glory in the way things unfold at work. You can see it in the majesty of, of creation all around us. There, there's a grand old hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When, when I clearly see God, I don't need to as clearly see every detail. And the other one from this is that people with faith like Abraham's use the word temporary a lot. There is a lot that is temporary in our world. New Year's resolutions come to mind. <laughs> they are often rather temporary. 
here's a picture of a little kid. You got to see the, the whole of this. But that little fella think, thinks he's about to win because he's only holding the one card. And you can tell that the person taking the picture is about to slap him with four cards. And at the top it says, uh, happiness is temporary. <laughs> um, a lot of us live in this neck of the woods who are being impacted by road construction. And whenever somebody posts about the inconvenience of the current state of affairs, someone else usually chimes in, well-intentioned, I am sure, to remind us all that this is temporary. No. Well, that's not what I want to hear when I'm sitting for seven minutes, not that I timed it, seven minutes <laughs> on 62 waiting for them to pave a lane. They just had shut down like a week ago. Pave it then, man. <laughs> when, you're, when you're stuck in traffic, right, and if, if you're anxious to get to the hospital or you're anxious to get to the golf course, well, wherever you're, it's hard to see this as temporary. Time has literally stopped. It's taking forever. And there's, there's wisdom in being able to pull back from this and, and see a broader picture. And if you were here last week, we had a, a very long white rope that trailed all the way out the door. And we held up this little red portion and said, these are your years. This is life on earth. It's temporary. Abraham pounded many a tent stake into the sand. Now in verse 9, Hebrews 11, 9 and 10. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Tents are not permanent. Right? They're designed to be portable. You know, I tried to pick a fancy one for the picture. You know? Even that, maybe not the most comfortable housing long term, but it'll get the job done especially if it's a short time and you know it. I'm going to guess that, that Sarah, Abraham's wife, had her fill of sand and dirt. I'm just, I'm thinking. You know, it's like living in a camper at the fair. For a week, it's okay. But after that, well, she did it for years and years and years. And, and, and I'm going to guess that she would have liked to have been able to like go into a more permanent kitchen and open a cupboard where there were just dishes, not dirt. Well, I'm going to guess that Abraham would have preferred a more permanent barn and some fencing where we didn't have to be concerned with protection every single day. You know, what kept them going? What, what got Abraham and, and Sarah and their family through those years? They knew it was temporary. Even, the, even Canaan, the promised land, even the, the best of the promise in this world is temporary. You know, I, I don't think you worry quite as much about the status of your tent when you know it's a temporary residence. And especially if you have a loved one who is a great craftsman building you a masterpiece, right? And some of us have done that. Some, some have lived in modulars and mobile homes and uh, garages while we're building the house. And, and when it gets tough, you know, it's, you, you say, oh, yeah, kids, we know it's not ideal, but it's temporary. We, we get through this. I, I always remind myself of temporary I think helps me to hold on things more loosely. It's, it's just temporary. I always go back to the, the addition behind you is now two decades old. And when I talked to some guys from a really big church and they were amazed, they said, how can your 50 families come up with it? Even 20 years ago, three quarters of a million dollars. You know, when they're saying, we got 500 families. We can't raise that kind of money. And in my mind, I didn't know how to answer them. I'm thinking, because people who understand all this is temporary. The money that we have, we're, we're stewards. We're managers. It's, it's not ours to keep. And I'm going to guess that there are a lot of people at church that understand every dime I have doesn't have to be tied up in payments and possessions. I'm not going to be here forever. It's temporary. And I will grant you that I think it's easy to list all the benefits of a larger house with a foundation and a kitchen and a basement and a garage and all that. But a house can become what? It can become a, either a 1,000 square foot or 2,000 or however many square foot that you have pretty wooden crate, essentially, right? That's just crammed full of all our stuff. And that's pretty much what it is. You know? and, and we enjoy all the amenities until they break. Drains clogged. Yards need mowed. 
Alexa's apparently on strike. I don't you know what. And I giggle now, but I'm pretty sure the internet's down right, right now in, in the building. It was this morning when I was here. Temporary. You know, when, when you have a tent, when you're camping, I, I don't worry about that stuff. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've, I've never mowed on vacation. Don't care. You know, it's like I just stop for a while and I head on. Deal with your own grass. You know? <laughs> the AC's not working in my hotel room, just give me another one. I don't, I'm not going to stay. I'm not going to fix that. That's your problem. You go camping, you go backpacking, hiking in the back country up there in Denali, you're packing it all in. You take everything, your housing, your food. And if you've been there, you know, what, just camping in general, what you lose in amenities, you make up for in freedom. You know, you just go. And I don't know if, I, maybe I'm the only one that does this, but you'll find me at my desk just watching those pictures just scroll through, you know, as a screensaver, just remembering all the stuff I wasn't worried about, <laughs> all the constraints I didn't have. <laughs> it was just freedom. Paul wrote the same thing to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4.18. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. What is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Even death. A faith like Abraham's sees tombstones <laughs> as temporary. And if you zoom in on that little stone under that flag, I know it's going to say, lest we forget. You know? But it's temporary. The island, this might be the most challenging, maybe this is the most powerful reminder in this message. Are, are we truly able to see death? And by that we mean being separated from faithful loved ones as temporary. Now that vision is not going to eradicate all the pain, but it's key in helping me cope. And if you're not familiar with the nuts and bolts of Abraham and Sarah's story, this promise to them that they will have generations, descendants like stars and grains of sand. And that obviously hinges on having children. And Abraham's 75, when he's given the promise, first hears of God's intention, he's going to be 100 years old before Isaac is born. This is Hebrews now 11, 11 and 12. By faith, Abraham... Even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. And he as good as dead. Hold, hold on to that. Put that in the back of your brain. Remember that line. He as good as dead. Abraham is seeing his body, her womb, for all intents and purposes of procreation as dead. You know, then they have Isaac. And then God makes a very bizarre request for Abraham to take the boy to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. If you go down to verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Well, there's, God stops Abraham mid-effort. You pass the test. No need to kill the boy. And you know people are upset by that. Always have been. People start reading the Bible like for the first time, and they start in Genesis, and they get to this chapter 22, and they just grind to a halt. You know, what kind of a God? Well, I don't know that I've ever seen this portrayed in a movie. I don't, if if it comes out now, I guarantee you somebody's going to put something online where they are just appalled. I, I don't understand the deity. That, it's very, very difficult for, for people of faith to, to enter into this conversation and, and try to calm somebody down and say, you, okay, you're, you're, you're seeing death the way most humans see it, which is the way the devil wants us to see it. That's why the Bible says it's the last enemy. That's not the way God sees it, and it's not even the way Abraham sees it here. If you, if you have verse 19 open, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Why would Abraham reason like that? If you, if you remember the wording we had, he is good as dead. Remember, <laughs> Abraham, in a sense, he's been there. Abraham understands what it is to see God take dead things, a body, a womb, 
and make them live again. That's his reasoning. And, one, and the account is in full in Genesis 22, and one of the most important verses for me is verse 5. You got Abraham, Isaac, a couple servants, a donkey, some wood. This is verse 5. He said to the servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Did you catch it? It's pretty, that's, it's pretty quick. Who's going to go worship? We will worship. My son and I. Who's going to come back? We will come back to you. <laughs> My son and I. Both of us. Abraham's 100% convinced Isaac's going to be alive. Instead of this account being a heinous example of a crazy deity demanding brutality, it's an example of what life and death look like when people of faith truly walk with God. When we are able to see what God sees, then I have an entirely different perspective on death. And everybody who hears this conversation has to figure out, where, where am I in that perspective? We, we make tombstones out of granite, marble, slate, bronze. We make them to last a long time. But compared to eternity, they're temporary. You saw a picture earlier of what was taken in Maple Grove here in Alexandria. Here's another one from that same day. There are stones in this cemetery today that can no longer be easily read. How, how, how long was Jesus in the grave? Three days. How did his followers feel for the duration of those three days? Miserable. And then Sunday comes, and they worship and rejoice when they realize death has been made forever temporary. And the world, culture needs that kind of hope. People need this joy. They need the peace. They, they need the adventure that comes from knowing my car, my house, even death and the loss of a loved one is temporary. That doesn't mean I don't try to maintain my house, my car, but it's temporary. It doesn't mean we don't grieve and won't miss our loved ones greatly. But that pain is also temporary. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 55, then 57. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Resurrected, returning Reuniting the Lord. It's an amazing adventure of faith you can be on when I realize how much in this world that pains me is temporary. I really, I, I think Abraham would be a lot of fun to go camping with. <laughs> um, his, his tense life was an adventure, to put it mildly. Abraham had this faith that figured out what was temporary. And Abraham had a faith that trusted God, even if he wasn't always given all the details. And I want to have a faith like that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for times when your word, uh, our family, neighbors, friends can remind us of that which endures. Um, there are times when we wish we knew more and we wish we knew it now. And that can be frustrating and even make us anxious. But to be able to see you, uh, to be able to trust you for the unfolding of today and tomorrow and beyond, whether we're all gathered in the same roof or spread out around the country, to know that you are there with all of us. And Father, we are striving to understand how temporary all this is, it will try to consume us today. Um, there will be much that will work on us to not see past uh, the next week. But we pray that we would be able to, even as we live in the moment and trust you for the future to understand that so much of this will so quickly pass. May we see and relish and appreciate the way that you work today. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Invitation this morning, a, a, an opportunity for you uh, to decide a, a decision that makes those end days uh, so very different is this.
I surrender all. If you know you need to make that decision today, let's stand. Um, you can come to the front as we sing 596, I surrender all. Because someday it's just going to stop. <laughs> just keep that in mind. Everybody always thinks there's another verse. <laughs> well, someday there's not going to be another verse. Amen. So that's it. That's true. You know. So you'll have time while we pray if you need to decide. But Sounds good. let's just do that. Yep. Can you pray for us? Yep. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you for your Son Jesus. Father, I thank you that we do not know all the details. And Father, we don't know that there will be another minute, another verse of a song, or any more time at all, Lord, because life is short. And Father, I just pray that if there's anyone that doesn't know you, that they take that opportunity, Lord. Father, thank you for your son, for the gift, and for salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's close with I'll Fly Away. Amen.